Classic Restos is proudly brought to you by Shannon's, insurance for motoring enthusiasts. Hair and Forbes Machinery House, Pace Farm, Hero Hoists, and Martin's Panel Masters. Like to see an Aussie legend that also has an admiration for classic vehicles? Well, stick around as you're about to see an exclusive interview on this week's Classic Restos. <laughs> There is one man, in my opinion, that stands for all things great here in Australia. He's a hell of a nice guy. He's a good bloke, and he's quite a character. He's also agreed to this exclusive interview. Now, on Classic Restos, it's not always about classic vehicles, but the apples, well, they don't fall far from the tree because the classics always end up tying in somewhere. Here's more. Dick Smith, all I can say is an absolute pleasure to meet you. How are you? Fletch, it's great to meet you. Thanks for your time this afternoon. You know, where do we go back with yourself? Me personally, when I think of Dick Smith, I think of RG58 and coax, and if you upgrade it to the thicker stuff, the RG8, PL259 plugs, CB radios, Playmaster speakers and stereo <laughs> systems for lounge rooms, yep. even Dick Smith kits, one of them which amazed me at the time, was a beer-powered radio. That's right. Now, when you've got a dad that used to like a beer, the radio would just never work. <laughs> I love it. Well, they were the early days. I mean, I was hopeless at school, lived on the northern Sydney suburb of Roseville, and uh, uh, no good at school, got a job in a factory. But then one day found out what I was good at, and that was running a business. And so I started a business. Originally, Dix with Electronics was servicing two-way radios and manufacturing equipment uh, selective calling units for two-way radios. And uh, then I moved on to selling components. Uh, then Gough Whitlam took the duty off the protection. In other words, all of our little local manufacturers closed down. Right. So I started importing and then we had the CB radio boom and all of those booms and uh, I did very well. Now, Dick, I was led to believe that you started off back in the days where a lot of our traditional Australian cars, our, Val our Falcons, uh, our Valiants, our Kingswoods, came with blank plates in the dashboards, and of a Saturday afternoon you might have got a call from a dealership saying, Dick, we've got a customer that wants to buy the car, we need an AM radio fitted, and you'd turn up with your box of tricks and you'd fit the AM radio to the car. That's exactly right. Virtually, virtually every car came without a radio. And also, it was the start of originally eight-track car players, then the Philips cassette player. And so we fitted those, wait for it, electric aerials. We started fitting the first electric aerials. And so, and basically, the cars came in incredibly basic. And so there was a big business there. So did, when, when that happened, and you had to get around there and fit the radios, what model cars were we looking at? Was, was it back like with EHs? Or I, at there? the time I was in, it was the HK Holden. So that must have been about 68, 69. I started the business uh, in uh, August of 1968. And uh, I remember, I think a, a bit of a story I must tell you, that uh, my background had been two-way radio, fixing manly cab radios. But to m make the business work OK, I thought I'd better do some car radio installation. Mm. But my marketing has always been better than actually the abilities I have. And I managed to get a full page in the North Shore Times. And it said, Dick Smith, the car radio specialist, you know, and he'll fit your car radio. Imagine today a young, enterprising guy that wants to fit radios to cars. Well, okay, uh, that, that's an industry that's gone. We can go way back. We, we, we talk of the likes of uh, Henry T. Ford. Uh, imagine starting in the car business now. I know we could chat for hours about the yeah. way things are going with manufacturing and that's a, that's a subject for another day. But it must have been a unique opportunity at the time where you thought to yourself at a few stages, hey, I think I'm onto something here. i tell you what was exciting about those days. We not only installed car radios, they were all made in Australia. Can you imagine that? There was a couple of Japanese car radios installed and everyone used to call them Jap junk. Yes. But uh, in fact, and as you know, in the end, the Japanese made the best electronics. But in those early days... There was uh, the General Motors had the contract with Astor, yes. a, a, a car radio manufacturing company in Melbourne. And then there was Ferris. Uh, there was Chrysler with a K. They made car radios. Yes. HMV, his master's voice, British company, but man all manufactured in Australia. 
So basically every radio I fitted was manufactured here in Australia. Our, our aerials, there's a fantastic bloke called Wally Bar, Wall Bar in Crown Street. It's all coming back to me. He manufactured all of the aerials in Australia for car radio aerials. Wow, that's amazing. Did it get frustrating for you? I know that you're so pro-Australian. I know I am as well. There's lots of us that are. Was it a confusing time when you realised that most of your stock had to come from overseas? Ah, oh, yes. Look, it was fascinating. I mean, one of the stories you hear is, oh, that Dick Smith, he's a hypocrite. He's supporting Australian farmers, but he imported electronics. Of course, they don't know the truth. The truth is, for the first five years of my business, everything was Australian made, and I actually manufactured electronic equipment. And one day I woke up in the morning, I think it must have been about 73 or something, there was a huge headline uh, the duty, the duty on electronic equipment had been completely cancelled. Right. And that was the Whitlam government. With no discussion, they took the duty off. And initially I thought, well, I'm going to go broke. Mm. Because within about 12 months, all of the local manufacturers closed down. The wonderful companies like AWA, mm. they closed, Ferris closed, they couldn't compete. Luckily for me, a friend of mine, Peter Shelley, who had a small shop in York Street in Sydney, he said, Dick, I'll show you how to import. And he took me overseas to Hong Kong and Japan introduced me to people and that was what saved my business being able to import but it was certainly I was forced to do it and I've always believed I would have done a lot better if I'd kept the manufacturing if we hadn't reduced the duty. Where was your first store? The first shop really was in the Big Bear at Neutral Bay and there's an interesting story here the Big Bear was a shopping centre but it was a failure it collapsed and at the Big Bear I think it must have been opened about 1966 and the incredible thing was that uh, basically Eric Anderson was a famous electronics company. It went broke. Virtually everyone went broke. Now, I found some premises in the car park of the Big Bear. Underneath, they were $15 a week rent. But when the problem was that when I'd ring up the car radio suppliers uh, to try and get an account with them, I'd say, it's Dick Smith. That was pretty suspect. What a name like Dick Smith. That can't be true. <laughs> then I'd say... And I've got a little car radio business I've started at the Big Bear. And they'd immediately think, not the Big Bear supermarket, everyone's gone broke there. And so in the early days, they wouldn't even take a check from me. I had to pay cash for my car radios, which was really good training because I'd only started with $610 and I had to work hard to get the money in to grow the business. No banker ever loaned me money, so it was basically growing by putting the profits back in. My passion for cars began when Nana and Pop bought their new Toyota Crown. It was Nana's, really. She loved that car. We went everywhere in it. My passion now is just the same, even though my cars are a little different. I've still got Nana's car, couldn't part with it. And I reckon if she was here today, she'd be insured with Shannon's too. Call Shannon's on 13 46 46. Shannon's, insurance for motoring enthusiasts. How would you like to double your garage space and work on your cars easily? Well, bring in your own hero with a Lift King hoist. Easy to install models in one, two and four post styles. Check the very nifty Spider 2500 portable mini scissor lift. Hero hoists are either Oz certified or carry the Euro CE, your guarantee of quality construction and reliability. I regularly stand under my Lift King, so when you need a bit of a lift, why don't you go stand under yours? Martin's Panel Masters has three modern accident repair centres. They service Melbourne's inner, outer east and the fast growing south east corridor. Your vehicle will receive the best from state of the art repair equipment finished beautifully from computer based paint mixing systems, finished in Australian compliant spray booths. Martin's Panel Masters, located at Ferntree Gully and Berwick, also Box Hill Panels. Hare and Forbes Machinery House has been family owned and operated for over 85 years and it's easy to see why. Planning on welding? Look at these welding tables and clamps, air compressors and different air tools, sandblasting cabinets, through to spray guns. Everyone is welcome at Machinery House. There are competitive freight rates around Australia and you can buy online at machinerywhouse.com.au. So remember, Hare and Forbes has the range. Dick, it was about honing business skills, starting from scratch. Where was your second shop? The second shop, we then moved to Gore Hill, where we had a shop for many years. 
The second shop then was at Bankstown on the corner of Meredith Street. That was when I started selling electronic components. But getting back to the old car radio days, I mean, I, I remember I used to go to all the dealers because normally a person would buy a new car and they'd order a car radio. And the, the person doing all the work was Howard Car Radio at Chatswood. And I tried to get some of his business. And after a few months, one company would give me a try and then another company. And eventually, after three or four years, I was doing most of the trade work on the North Shore, so that was exciting. The reason I was asking about the shops was alluding to, have you had some stressful moments? Have you had some sleepless nights in the early days? Ah, oh, well, after we had the business going for five months, this is the business selling electronic components. One, first of all, very strange, the manager and his offside resigned, and I thought, that's strange. Then about five weeks later, I was, walking, I was down working in the premises at night, and I found these envelopes that had been hidden and they had invoices for $18,000 worth of goods that as subsequently we found had been stolen. And this particular manager had been coming in at night, ordering extra goods, putting them into his car and then hiding the invoices. Now I was so dumb and immediately I called the police and they said, oh, we know him, Jew, he, we, he's got form. But we went down, we got a search warrant, they went down to his house and he had my components, but he had some auction receipts. And he said, oh, no, I bought these at an auction and there's no way you could identify them. But it was the best thing that ever happened because it plunged the business into receivership. And I thought, look, that was the most stupid thing I've ever done. I know car radios and two-way radios and I was still doing okay there. Why did I get into selling electronic components? I know what I'll do as I'll work hard, uh, pay all the debt back and then close that business down and stick to what I know. But as it was in paying back the debt, I suddenly realised, wow, this is where the money is. And so after two years, I paid the $18,000 back and then closed the car radio business down and expanded the electronic components. And what, about eight years later, I sold the business for over $20 million to Woolworths. You've done some remarkable things in your career. A lot of it has been from a big heart as well. You donate to many charities. It then takes me to 1985, the inception of the bash. Right. Um, now, it's an idea that has spread around the world. Yep. Uh, now, I was led to believe you had an E.H. Holden that, yep. uh, that you first did that in. Uh, tell us about... The well, I'll tell you how I came up with the concept. As a kid, I used to watch the Red X trials. And I remember, uh, Jelly Knight, Jack Murray, wow! And, and I, my, my cousin took me out at the second Red X trial, the first one... I remember standing on the side of a road at night and the car's driving through and we're screaming like mad. The second Red X trial, uh, I, they, I think they ended up back at Parramatta Park and I was taken over there and these cars that were pretty wrecked were coming back in again. Well, I thought one day I'm going to go on a Red X trial. But by the time I had enough money to buy a car and afford to be able to go on a Red X trial, there weren't any. So I thought, I oh, know, I'll, I'll start up a Red X trial and I had lots of wealthy friends and some of them were pretty miserable because <laughs> wealthy people don't like giving money away because they're scared they're going to be called a do-gooder. So I thought, oh, I've got a way around this. So I came up with this concept of a car trial. First of all, I said the cars have to be at least 20 years old. So that was going to stop the showing off of the really wealthy buying the most expensive car. Then I said, you're going to be able to donate money to charity, to variety, by bribing and cheating. And I thought that completely solves the do-gooder problem because I'd, I was the sole judge of the scrutineer for the bash, and at the morning I'd say, well, who wants to win today? And uh, oh, I win five grand, 10 grand, 20 grand. John Singleton's paying 20,000, he wins today. And so it was an acceptable way for wealthy people, people like Bob L, and um, uh, famous people, many of them, to donate to a good cause but not being considered a do-gooder. Now, speaking of cars, Dick, the bash might have been one thing, but yourself personally, you go back to your first car you might like to share with me and yeah. tell me what that car was. My first car was a little Morris Minor. It was a little black Morris Minor. I think it was a side valve. I'm pretty sure it was, but I might be wrong. And it was a lovely little car. I think it cost 400 pounds. And I was working in a factory making two-way radios, soldering up stuff and then driving my girlfriend around in my little Morris Minor. In those days, we used to go fox hunting. I'm a radio ham. And we had an aerial mounted on the, a little, looked like a little TV aerial, and it could go direction finding. Yep. And we'd send out the fox, which would be one of the hams, and he'd hide across in another suburb or yep. in some strange place, turn on his transmitter, yep. and then we'd have to direction find and 
find the fox. So that was what I used that first car for. Now, Dick, are you a car guy? A car guy? Yeah, I think I am. Yeah, I love cars. I bought myself a Peter Brock Commodore once. And once at Oran Park... Would that have been a VC? Ah, oh, I can't remember. I can't remember which it was, but it was fantastic. Larry Perkins advised me. Larry Perkins is a good friend of mine, so he advised me what to do. Went down, met Peter Brock in Melbourne, yeah. and then they made this car up for me, and wow. It's the only car I've really pranged. I was showing off <laughs> to my daughters and my wife driving down to, into the, uh, uh, the National Park, and, and I said, gee, if I keep driving at the speed, I'll probably run off the road, and I did, into a cliff. But luckily, not too much damage. I could back out and drive home. And my girls keep talking about my driving career. Now, I've always loved cars. I, I made some money and I bought a Ford Fairlane. After the Morris Minor, I had an FC Holden panel van, but one with windows in the side and a little fold-up seat. Love the FC Holden. Always been a Holden man. Then I actually bought myself an EH Holden on higher purchase. But after three months, I handed it back. I didn't like the idea of borrowing money and bought a little tiny six volt Volkswagen. And that was a great car. Then started my business, did well, bought a big Fairlane V8. I loved it. Oh, the transition of vehicles, oh. Dick. You, you went from the small British yes. car yes. to the beautiful uh, American inspired Fairlane. Yeah. Then, wait for it, I had a V6 Capri. Wow. I used to drive from Sydney to a little kit home we were building in Jindabyne in four and three quarter hours. I'd sit on 100 miles an hour. It was the time before there weren't many speed, there weren't any speed cameras. Yeah. So my V6 Capri, that was, I loved that. And then after that, I had the Brock Commodore. Now I've got two electric cars. I've got a little Nissan Leaf that I use in Sydney. Yeah. And I've got the uh, Tesla, the whatever, the super duper one that if you put your foot down, it's as if an F111 ran into the back of you. In fact, my family won't come driving with me. They said, you've got to turn off incredulous mode or whatever well, they, it is. They can probably remember the time when you prang that other car. Yeah, they probably do. Into the cliff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, we've got the sensational helicopter behind us, uh, and you'll have to educate me here, Dick. Yep. As much as I admire this machine, I think it's incredible. I love aircraft. I love helicopters. But some of the places yep. that you, you have been around the world, yep. as a solo guy, yep. uh, even before GPS, now that's, that's always amazed me. We could go way back to the days of Captain Cook and you look at uh, yep. some of the, their routes on the ocean and they're, 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 they're basically <laughs> yeah. zigzagging just to, right. and it's, oh, we found, we found some land. What was that time like? Well, it was great. I've been lucky. I've done five flights around the world and I'm still alive. Two by helicopter, one solo. The first two flights I did around the world were before GPS was invented. So you never really were, knew where you were. Um, I had to land on a ship between Japan and Alaska to get across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, in those times, 1983, it was the time of the Cold War and Russia wouldn't let you land there. So I put some drums of fuel on a ship, but I had to find the damn ship because it was just heading across the Pacific. And I made up, I still own Dick Smith Electronics, so I got a special price on some electronic components <laughs> and I made up a little black box, or a friend did. It was a find the ship kit. It was a find the ship kit. It was a, what we call a non-directional beacon. Right. And it connected to a 12 volt car battery. I put a friend on the ship in Japan. Three and a half days later, he connects up the 12 volt battery throws the aerial over the ship's crane and I'm 600 miles away direction finding in on that signal and eventually found the ship, two hours rolling around pumping the drums in and then took off and just got into Alaska the, that night having flown a long way over water. Every weekend around Australia, motoring enthusiasts get together to share their passion for cars and bikes. It's a passion that brings us together. All sorts of people, all sorts of cars and bikes. From the classics of today to the classics of tomorrow. At Shannon's, we understand enthusiasts. So when it comes to insurance, it's got to be Shannon's. Shannon's, insurance for motoring enthusiasts. Call 13 46 46 for a quote. How would you like to double your garage space and work on your cars easily? Well, bring in your own hero with a Lift King hoist. Easy to install models in one, two and four post styles. Check the very nifty Spider 2500 portable mini scissor lift. Hero hoists are either Oz certified or carry the Euro CE, your guarantee of quality construction and reliability. I regularly stand under my Lift King, so when you need a bit of a lift, why don't you go stand under yours? 
Martins Panel Masters has three modern accident repair centres. They service Melbourne's inner, outer east and the fast growing south east corridor. Your vehicle will receive the best from state of the art repair equipment finished beautifully from computer based paint mixing systems, finished in Australian compliant spray booths. Martin's Panel Masters, located at Ferntree Gully and Berwick, also Box Hill Panels. If you have a restoration project, Hair and Forbes has the tools that you need. Shrinker stretchers, dollies, mallets, bead rollers, profile gauges, professional panel restoration kits and so much more. Now I warn you, enter at your own risk because you will end up buying something. So come along to your Cap City store or browse and buy online at machineryhouse.com.au because Heron Forbes has the range. You know what, Fletch, I've been watching you for years and even though I'm not the complete car enthusiast that some people are, every bloke loves a car and dreams of, I want to buy a yellow Rolls Royce, by the way, if there's someone watching, I want to get a yellow convertible Rolls Royce, surely you must be able to buy one of those. You know that that's a British car, Dick. Oh, is it? I didn't know that. Oh, no, I don't think so. No. I think they're made down in Geelong. We're not making cars anymore, no, so you're, so you're, you're right, you're safe yeah. in saying that. It's interesting, you know, I have two electric cars, a Nissan Leaf and the Tesla, and I did place an order for an electric car that was being made in Geelong. And I waited for three years and unfortunately the company had to close down. But when I could buy Australian, I always did. I love my Brock Commodore. Yes. Let me tell you a little story just on closing. I've never been, you think flying around the world is pretty frightening. And it is sometimes in bad weather. Yeah. But I've never been so frightened. I was out for a driver training weekend that GMH put on. Peter Brock was running it and Brocky said, Dick, would you like to come for a drive around the circuit? <laughs> and sort of he took me for a drive around the circuit. I have never been so scared. Yeah. I couldn't believe, I think he was showing off a bit, but he's such an incredible driver. And to think, God, I'm sitting with Peter Brock. I had no idea he was gonna die early. It was only you and your dry cleaner that knew how scared you were. Exactly. And this unbelievable, how he could drive a car. Yeah. Unbelievably fantastic. It's something that I'll never forget. And it was such a tragic loss when he went to. It was, I mean, and, and Steve Irwin, you know, within months sort of thing, to yeah. lose those wonderful, famous Australian icons. It the old saying. me greatly. Well, yeah, the old saying of turning around and biting you, and that's, you know, pardon the pun, that was Steve. It's, it's interesting, and it's one of the reasons I've done five flights around the world and two quite risky balloon flights, and the reason everyone says, what's your next adventure? And I realised that if I kept doing that, I was going to die. I've been in some very dangerous situations and my heroes people like Kingsford Smith Bert Hinkler they all died by pushing it too yes, much exactly. and so if you keep doing things at high speed at high level of risk well one day it'll catch up to you not a silly question what's your thoughts on Kingsford Smith where is he where do you reckon he went down ah fascinating well Kingsford Smith the common story is that he was flying at night trying to he was virtually broke so he's trying to do another record flight from England to Australia and the story is that he flew low at night and clipped the top of this little island called Ayr Island, A-Y Island, in Burma. I have a feeling he crashed many miles south because another aircraft saw his exhaust go overhead at night. I think he somehow crashed, whether it was a mechanical problem with the aircraft, and then the plane and the oleo leg has drifted back to this island. So somewhere the Lady Southern Cross, the Lockheed Delta he was flying, will be there under the water. I've flown down there at low level looking and it's all mud and very high tidal currents, so it's going to be very hard to find. So you've actually tried to find him? Oh, absolutely. I've been twice along that coast at Burma. I've flown the route of Kingsford Swift where he's supposed to fit the island. Oh, Dick. In ending, you're such an iconic Australian. You're, you're loved by hundreds of thousands of people, myself included. Oh. Here is a jar of the Dick Smith peanut butter. And that's Yum. come from my pantry at home, Dick. And I'm not, oh. I'm not just saying that that's uh, some of the nicest peanut butter you'd ever have. It is, because it's Australian made. Do you realise that both Woolies now get their peanut butter, their home brand from China, and the big one, Aldi, the German company, they bring it in from Argentina. It's less than half our price because... Of course, you're paying subsistence wages. There you go. Classic restos now talk about peanut butter. Yeah. One other thing, Dick, before I let you go. Now, is it true or not that if you advertise a price for something under the Consumer Act, that uh, the distributor or the retailer has to stick and abide by the price? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Right. Oh, well, that that right then yeah. takes me. That, ta oh, geez, that, that takes me to this. One. Now, yeah. Dick, you, <laughs> you advertised a stereo in here for $300. Now, 
<laughs> How have you got, got an original, a 1979 catalogue? A 1979 yep. Dick Smith jumbo catalogue with the gorgeous Qantas 747 yeah. on the front there. Yeah. I've had that obviously since then, Dick. Uh, so um, I just thought I'd bring that along. Um, I want to hold you to your prices on some of this stuff. Fletch, whenever I watch your show, <laughs> I've always wondered if you are as old-fashioned as you come over. You definitely are because this is probably the catalogue he still has. Mate, 79, yeah. wow. Look at that. Does that bring back memories? Oh, it does. I, I wrote all of the, the text for this catalogue. My wife, Pip, typed it all up. But you, drew, you, but you drew pictures of yourself. Yeah, yeah, of course I did. Oh, well, I got people to do that. I mean, the, the thing was, I was advised by someone, I was going to call Dick Smith Electronics. I was going to call it Alltronics. And this friend of mine said, no, no, no one can have a name like Dick Smith. Call it Dick Smith Electronics. And that's what I did. And, of course, there's the famous Dickhead which we had for years. Look at this, at 19 cents. You'll be able to sell this for 75, you'd be able to sell this for 80 cents. <laughs> Dick, have you got any of these? Yeah, I've got a complete selection of them. By the way, that's when I found the Kookaburra aircraft and in the Tanami Desert, because wow. I was able to, oh look, I'm towing the iceberg into Sydney Harbour. The stuff you did. Yeah, because I didn't have, let me explain to you. Is that, look, that's oh, wow, well, you wouldn't be allowed to do that today. That's. Complete. Dick Smith's dressed up as a Chinaman because we had a shop in Hong Kong and we said, don't go Wong in Hong Kong, come to Dick Smith's. And I got away with it. In these days, oh, you'd never be allowed to say that. But it's just fun. But I must tell you, the iceberg, I had no money for advertising, having started Dick Smith Electronics with $610. So I came up with the idea that one day I was going to tow a real iceberg from Antarctica and cut it up into ice cubes and call them Dixicles. Now, that was impossible because it would have melted. But one of my friends working for me at Dick Smith's, Jerry Nolan, he said, Dick, April Fool's Day is coming up. Let's tow a fake iceberg into Sydney Harbour, which we did, and everyone fell for it. It's still listed as one of the 10th greatest hoaxes in the, in the world. And the amazing thing was it cost $1,200 to do. So it was great for publicity. Unreal. All right. In ending, Dick, it's, as you, this is proof that I've <laughs> waited most of my life and career to get an opportunity to interview you. It's been wonderful catching up and uh, great, on, on, great the, on, the, on the behalf of, <laughs> I reckon, every viewer of Classic Restos and the people of Australia, Dick, well done. Wonderful to meet you too. Thank, Thank you. you. The man, what a legend, Dick Smith. And I hope you've really enjoyed this special episode of Classic Restos. As I say at the end of every show, until next week, no matter where you're watching Classic Restos from, please ride and drive safe. I'm Fletch and I thank you very much for watching. You can like and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Classic Restos TV and watch catch-up episodes at shannons.com.au. Classic Restos is proudly brought to you by Shannons, insurance for motoring enthusiasts. Hair and Forbes Machinery House, Pace Farm, Hero Hoists and Martin's Panel Masters.